you all so much. I really appreciate it. Can you guys hear you okay back there? Is it sound good? All right, nice. Uh, the first thing is I want to acknowledge uh, some of my friends who are able to be here tonight uh, who are also wonderfully talented, and I've, some of them I've actually got to collaborate with in different capacities, and others uh, we've just kind of shared ideas. One of them is my friend Valentin, uh, Valentino uh, Romero, who's right here. Valentino, can you raise your hand? Yeah, wonderful. Who I actually got the pleasure of meeting up in Shambhala Mountain up in Red Feather Lakes one day because I was looking for if there were any other brown people up there. And he was like, I recognize another brown man. And I was like, nice. I said, what do you do here? He goes, I'm the mechanic. <laughs> but Valentino's here, so thank you so much. Also, my friend Mark Silent Bear. Uh, Mark, raise your hand real quick, who's a wonderful musician here from Boulder. He's a folk musician as well as uh, Elena Holly Cliver also here. Wonderful radio personality at KGNU, and so thank you for doing that on the radio as well for us. We collaborated on a song about a year ago also and recorded a fantastic song, which maybe we'll talk a little bit about. My friend Lorianne Guerrero, who's all the way from um, San Antonio, is here, so thank you, Lorianne. My friend Daniel Grambaugh, who I conspired with at Bennington College in Vermont. And of course, my good friend here, Brian Aspas, who's, came, who's probably drove the furthest today, uh, about two hours, came up from Colorado Springs. Fantastic writer, also a great voice. So thank you all for being here and all of you lovely faces. I appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the first things that caught my attention was this idea of designers without, border, I mean, without boundaries. I guess for me, it'd be like without borders. <laughs> designers without boundaries. So earlier, as uh, Kevin was, was talking about sort of being a maker, that idea, that's exactly what the same idea is too for me as an artist, right? It was, it was artists without boundaries or without borders, artists without, and now a lot of these boundaries and borders aren't necessarily even physical, but the ones I kind of approach are more psychological boundaries that we place on ourselves as artists and as people, you know, um, going about our lives. And I've always tried to work towards, towards identifying those boundaries in my own self, the things that I have as biases or as, you know, prejudices, uh, or even just as kind of obstacles I place on myself as a writer, as a human being, as an activist, as a community organizer. And, and how do I transcend some of these? Um, the current US Poet Laureate, who is the first Latino to hold that position, Juan Felipe Herrera, you know, he says, poetry is a way for us to transcend boundaries and borders, right? That's what poetry does for us. And I like to think that all art does that, you know, all art. So um, yeah, was that a one hand clap right there? <laughs> Um, that said, I also want to thank Tori as well, uh, and uh, CU Boulder, and of course Boulder High, and Jennifer Douglas Larson, who I worked with her students there at Boulder High, and of course the Environmental Design Department, and Mara, thank you so much, and the Growing Up Boulder uh, team initiative, Growing Up Boulder. We talked about this earlier today, Growing Up Boulder. What does that mean to grow up Boulder? Um, I didn't grow up Boulder. I grew up San Joaquin Valley in Central California. Um, you know, I grew up uh, train tracks and uh, nothing but agriculture, uh, fields for days. I grew up uh, as a kid throwing rocks at the trains because there was nothing else to do in my small town. I grew up chasing opossums uh, out, of, uh, out of stones. <laughs> and I also grew up running indoors into our elementary school at Cutler School Elementary because the crop dusters would come by and spray pesticides over all the crops. And all the teachers would go, run inside, go run inside. We'd all run inside as kids. I also grew up South Texas. I never actually lived in South Texas. How does one grow up South Texas if you've never lived in South Texas, right? Well, we talked about this earlier. Some of you have family in different parts of the world, great grandparents, grandparents. And so therefore, you also grow up where they grew up, right? We grow up where our parents grew up, too, because that's what informs us, right, as people. We grow up there, too. So, and I imagine that you know, growing up in California, I used to always think, early as a kid, I thought, I'm growing up California. And then I realized nobody grows up California. <laughs> you know, you think you grow up California, but you're actually growing up South Texas. You know, you're growing up other places. One of the things, though, too, is that I would see on TV the a certain, t a certain California, you know, the certain California on the uh, travel brochures and, and on TV ads and stuff. And it wasn't the California I grew up in. So I had this kind of growing up identity crisis about where I was growing up at. And I imagine, and in working with Boulder High students for, I, I've actually worked with them now for, gosh, almost 10 years. I've worked with the students at Boulder, not only Boulder High, Columbine Elementary, um, just various schools, Casey Middle School. Um, and I gather, too, that th they have a very similar experience. Growing up Boulder to them is not the growing up Boulder that we see on, on brochures and travel ads. You know, growing up Boulder to them means growing up you know, a little bit further north, perhaps, or growing up Zacatecas, or growing up you know, Jalisco. You know, for them, growing up Boulder means something else, you know. And so 
it just means a lot to me to be able to be here and, and talk with you a little bit and share the stories of uh, stories of it's intersection stories, voices, expression of young people's resilience. Young people's resilience. So I'm going to share a poem with you from one of those young people, uh, Luis Porteo. Is Luis here this evening? He said he was going to make it. I promise you, Mr. Hernandez, I will make it today. And he didn't make it. So I'm going to read his poem for him. You, such a resilient town, matured, such amazing people too, strong minds to keep moving forward into the future. Resilient, small town has thought me to be so cautious. Such a resilient, small town, terrible flood. Such a resilient, small town has thought me to move forward. But life, life is unfair. These things happen when it's dark out. You are such a resilient, small town. You, with your uh, restaurants, have matured me. 17 years, you are resilient like I am. Resilient, small town, resilient, bolder. That was Luis Porteo. Let's give a round of applause for Luis, just for creating this. When I, um, when I go into these course, these classes, uh, these classrooms, you know, one of the ways that I have learned that I'm able to get some of the students to open up and talk more about, um, you know, just what they're, like today we had this uh, workshop about resilience. And we said, you know, what is resilience? And we asked them, talk about your family, tell us about resilience, moments of resilience in your family, right? Um, surely we've all, you know, we've all experienced resilience and what that means and even in, in witnessing our father, witnessing our mother, our aunts, uncles, brother, sister, right? We see moments of resilience, so I asked them to do that. And of course, they were timid, right? Because, because you know why, as students, what we do is we grow up actually being taught how to write everything else externally and, you know, expository, right? But we, but we rarely get asked to write what we think, what we feel, right? Our own voice. And that's a, that's a frightening thing for young folks. It's a frightening thing. So what works is I will go into the classroom and I'll share with them something of myself that is frightening and, and vulnerable and, and, a, and an instance of resilience. And then they start to open up and share some of that. So I think as a sort of invitation to you all to maybe share your stories beyond these walls once we leave, uh, I'm, gonna sh I'm gonna share actually some of what resilience has meant to myself as a young man growing up and how we get to this place of design, designers without boundaries and also artists and writers without boundaries, right? And humanitarian workers without boundaries. So hopefully it all ties itself into this big intersection. Um, let's see here, I actually come from, that's me at one years old on my father's back. They were migrant farm workers, my parents, and um, my mother and father there. That was in Wyoming, in the fields of Wyoming. And, uh, you know, that's how I grew up, was uh, the child of migrant farm workers. And um, one, of the, one of the earliest memories I had that I think fascinated me, caught my attention, caught, captured my imagination, was that we used to be uh, place, this is back in the day when you could ride in the back of a pickup truck and it was like not illegal, you know, <laughs> keep going down the highway, kids like waving their hands and stuff. Now it freaks me out. I see it, I'm like, oh my God. But we used to do that, you know. We get all piled in, all the cousins would pile into the back of my grandfather's truck. They put a camper shell on it and we go from California all the way to Wyoming, right? And my grandfather used to say, you know, he used to hate that I would sit in the middle, want to sit in the middle in the front because he said I talk too much. You know, he'd call me a perico. He just said perico. You know, all he does is talk. He talks, he talks, he talks. That's so like, does he ever shut up, you know? But I used to always, I was curious. You know, I'd say, why? Why, Grandpa? Why? 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 And he'd say, what? And say, because I said. You know, they get to that point. Because I said so. But my grandfather used to, I would never forget, he had this beautiful little compass on the front dashboard. Because back then there was no GPS, right? All he said was like, as long as I know in what direction I'm going, I can take any road and I'll get to where I gotta go. I know, I know where that's at. He had his compass there. And he would drive this truck and we would drive all the way up these roads. And then he would say, um, he would see something. And he would say, imaginate. And I was like, what does that mean? I mean, Spanish was not my first language. You know, Spanish actually was the language my parents used to tell secrets in front of us as kids. That's how I grew up with Spanish. So I learned it, right? I had to. I was like, you know, a mole. I was on the inside trying to learn what that meant. And I learned Spanish that way, but I was never invited to participate. But I understood it, so it worked it to my advantage. My grandfather would say, imaginate. Like one time we were driving through, um, it was, uh, gosh, Yellowstone? Is it up there in Wyoming, Yellowstone? Is that right? Yeah, Yellowstone. We're driving through Yellowstone. 
there was a fire that um, that year, maybe 78, no, no, maybe like 80, somewhere around there, 79, 1979, and we're driving, there was a big fire in Yellowstone. And I remember seeing animals, like the, the cars were stopped on the road, and I remember seeing animals like tearing across the highway and stuff because they were trying to get away from this fire. And I remember my grandfather going, Mahinate. And I was like, what does that mean? What does he mean by imagine that? Was he inviting me to imagine, imagine being burned? Imagine being an animal. Imagine if that fire catches up to us. Like, I didn't know, but it, just the ambiguous idea of imaginate. Imagine. So all, one of my earliest memories is driving in my grandfather's back of his pickup truck, staring out those little windows, those little box windows from the camper shell. And my grandfather, you know, periodically saying, imagine, imagine. <laughs> and I think that played a role later on, you know, as a kid. Um, so I ended up... Uh, uh, one of the things, I remember being in high school, and again, this I think goes, plays even to the idea of resilience. Um, and also, I think it's a very critical kind of observation on the power of teachers. Um, I was in high school, and I don't know if they have this anymore, because it's been so long that I've been there. They used to have a career counselor in high school, and you'd go see the career counselor, I don't know, when you're about to graduate or something, maybe like junior, when you were a junior in high school or something, I don't know. And the career counselor would say, Okay, let's, uh, let's put all this information in here. We're going to tell you what would be a great career for you, Tim. And, and uh, this is, okay, 2 plus 2 equals, uh, you know, gold. And then, and then they would spit out this paper. And they would wave the paper. And then I would sit there going, oh, what am I going to be? What am I going to be? <laughs> and they go, and then she goes, uh, i never forget the, the teacher. She goes, it says here, Tim, oh, oh, this is good. This is real good. You're going to love this. You can be an ag engineer. And I was like, I was all hyped up. And then she said, ag engineer, an agriculture engineer. I went, oh, I was deflated. And then she goes, oh, you don't know? Yeah, OK. Well, you know, are you good at math? And I was like, not really. She's like, OK, well, then don't worry about ag engineer. Um, it says here, you can be a scientist. And I was like, here. And then I go, scientist? Oh. I had this sense of what I wanted to be. I just didn't know it yet. And I wanted her to, I wanted her to hit it right on the nose, right? And then she goes, or you could be an artist. And I went, yeah, I knew it. And she goes, you want to be an artist? And I go, yeah. Yeah, I would love to be an artist, because I was more into painting at the time. I never actually wrote at the time. It was just painting. I love painting. And she goes, why would you want to be an artist, Tim? You have to die to be famous. <laughs> she looked at me puzzled. You have to die to be famous. And I was like, I mean, that really messed me up. I was like. Wow, she's right. That sucks. Why do I want to die? I don't want to die. And I went home really kind of just rejected, feeling like, what does that mean? You know, later on I learned that, you know, I didn't I never wanted to be famous. I just wanted to do what I love doing, you know? Like I wish she had said that, you know, but it wasn't it wasn't that way. But uh but I always I've always felt like I've been, had this kind of um little uh, capacity to, to turn uh, pain into power, you know, that whole idea of when someone tells you you can't do something, then you do it. Right, that rebellious nerve, and I love seeing that in um, in high school kids, especially young kids. Even I have a seven-year-old who's like the most rebellious of all my kids. Is a seven-year-old, you know. But that rebellion is that kind of what later on be turns into like audacity, right? The audacity that your voice matters, you know. The audacity that you think you have something so important to say, the audacity. And for us, I, for me as a kid, it's the rebelliousness. I do have something. Whether it's important or not, I don't know, but what the hell, I'm going to say it anyway, you know? And um, that's how some of that early stuff started. Uh, at 16, uh, my parents started to go through this divorce, started to go through a separation. And um, by then, uh, I had uh, taken to a skateboard, and I was only skateboarding, and I was only playing baseball. And I was skateboarding one night on my way home, you know? It was late at night. I don't know what I was doing out, like, 1 in the morning. I had been to a party, and, uh, you know, but, my, but I was like... It was lame because my friends hooked up with some girls and I didn't. So I was like 16 going home, you know, forget these, forget these guys. I was going home and I was on my skateboard and all the main street, the, old, the only main street in town was all black. It was shut down and I was on my way home and all of a sudden I saw a light in a window and I stopped and my maybe rebelliousness, my curiosity, I saw a light in a window and I went, huh, that's interesting. Picked up my skateboard, I went, <laughs> picked up my skateboard, believe it. So <laughs> I go to the door, the door's lit, and I notice that the door is actually stairs going up. 
stairway, stairway going up, up. And there's a light coming down. And I go, huh. And I lean against the door to see closer, and the door pushes. And I went, ooh, it's open. That's all right. Looked around. So I opened the door. OK, and this is a true story. I open the door, and a voice goes, I'm up here. God? <laughs> I was like, I didn't know. Who's up there? I was like, I didn't answer. I just kind of clinched my skateboard. And I took one step up the stairs. Come back here. I'm up here. Took another step. <laughs> Went all the way up the stairs. Got to the top of the stairs. Now another long hallway with doors, various doors. And I heard Jimi Hendrix coming out of one of like the, one of the uh, rooms. So I go back there. It's like, I'm back here. And I'm like, who's calling me? Who knows I'm here? So I get there. And growing up in a small rural farm worker town, you never see what I saw that. You never see it anywhere. It blew my mind. This is how I knew I was on the right path. This was after I was rejected by my uh, teacher. There was a man sitting on a, in front of his job. He was sitting on a bucket with his back turned to me. So pretend you're walking through the door. He had his back. His back was like this. And there was a canvas probably about the size of this screen. And he had one of these Rembrandt brushes, which if you know, you know painting, sometimes you do like brushes that are that long so that you can just sit back, smoke your cigarette, and paint like this. <laughs> And he was smoking and painting, and he goes, hey, man, come on in. And I was like, and all around the walls, wall to wall, were, were paintings. And I went, man, this is a real artist. I never knew that such things existed in this town, that it was all fermented oranges and, you know, <laughs> and farm workers. But this guy was a real artist. His name was Joseph Dela Cruz, and he was my first art teacher. And um, I began to paint and take painting very serious. I took myself very seriously. In fact, I went to school and I said to the, to the counselor that, that year, I'm dropping out. And he was like, yeah, does your mom know? And I was like, she's fine. She's, she's cool with it. She knows she's cool with it. And he was like, yeah, let's call her. Mrs. Hernandez, Tim's here. Yeah, he says he's dropping out. What? I'll be right there. <laughs> Came and thank God I didn't drop out. I had my mother. I didn't have to drop out. But um, I did have with me a... Um, Actually, oh yeah, I have one slide here. This was a high school newspaper. Uh, <laughs> talked about my first painting. It's right there on the right-hand side there with the two eyeballs looking up. I'll go to the next picture now. All right, so <laughs> uh, that's me there with, uh, with my uncle, Virgil Zuniga. Um, he, uh, you know, he saw that I would paint, and, and to me, he became one of the kind of first, uh, first instances, I think, our first images of resilience. My uncle, how many of us have, raise your hand, how many of us have, Relatives who maybe the rest of your family refers to as the cat, the one who has the nine lives. No? Is that just a few of us? Just, just me? Really? Yeah, some of us have those uncles, that relatives, like they've survived like many things that should have killed them at one point or another, and they're alive. Come on. I just, okay, you just nod. Yeah, we know that guy, right? We know. That's my Uncle Virgil right there. He was the cat, the guy who had nine lives. He should have been killed many times. One time he flew his truck off of a bluff in the town of Bakersfield, 200 feet below into a ravine. We, his truck was scattered everywhere. We saw specks of blood along the hillside. We were looking for him, couldn't find his body. They scraped the bottom of the thing. They couldn't find him. But like two days later, our, my aunt gets a phone call, and she's like, he's alive. He had his friends. We go over there, and he's got bandages around his whole body, his blood leaking out. And he's like, you know, we're like, you should go to the hospital. He's like, yeah, I know. I say, you know, so we take him to the hospital. And he tells us what happened. He crawled out of that situation and flagged some kids down and put them in their car and he, they went and you know helped them actually one of the kids dad was like a pharmacist or something and they wrapped him up and um that was one instance but he had, he had all these situations like that so we never thought you know that he would actually exhaust the ninth one right it was like it was like how many is like the cat with 18 lives you know he just kept going um during this time i was painting and um now i was uh, i was gosh i want to say i was like 18 years old and I got invited to, um, to teach art, teach watercolor in Corcoran State Penitentiary. I was, 18, I was 19 years old, I was 19 years old. Corcoran State Penitentiary, which is where they kept Charles Manson for a little while. He was there, you know, in California, Central California. And they invited me to go teach watercolor. I was 19 years old, and I was like, hell no, I ain't going over there. And they were like, the money is great. And I was like, oh God, I never made that much money. You know, I don't know, it was like $10 an hour. And I was like, wow, that was, you know, fantastic. And my uncle kept saying, what are you afraid of? You know, you got guards everywhere. They're all locked up. You're, go, go teach. You know, he'd always struggled to find work. So he was like, go, go teach, go. And I was like, 
no, uncle, I can't do it. I can't, you know. I said, so I never did. But he was like, come on. You know, he's, and then he would always champion me. He was that one uncle who would just champion you for everything. It didn't matter if you were right or wrong. In his eyes, you were always right. He championed you. And then he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he began living with us. And then he became like my older brother. And he lived with us. And um, one morning, there was a knock at the door. There's a, it always starts to knock at the door. Huh? It's like it's probably going to be a knock on the window or something, you know. There's a knock on the door. And uh, it's the police, and they tell my family that uh, he was shot and killed. And, um, you know, and they said uh, the situation was he was unarmed. They thought he had a gun or, or a knife, but they shot and killed him, uh, the police. And so, um, you know, it shook up our whole world. Uh, it shook up our world. And it's, that's one of the beautiful things about working with youth, you know, is you can recognize that in their eyes. You can recognize that in all of our eyes, right, where that there's these moments in our lives where we've, We've bounced back, you know. We've come back. We've, we've been the sort of living example of resilience, uh, whether it's emotionally or physically. And the kids have that. You know, they have that at a young age, and I get to see that. And my, my, I always feel like my job is just to encourage them to, that it's worth hearing about. It's worth telling that story, you know. Uh, and so in my case, after that happened with Virgil, uh, I was painting, a, doing a painting, and I started to put words in the paintings. You know, at first they were angry words. Later on, they just became sort of words that I don't know where they came from. But every time I paint, I put a word inside the painting. And my art instructor at the College of Sequoias uh, said to me, you know, you should really, uh, you know, you should really probably tone down the writing that's in your painting because it comes across as kitschy, as you know, kind of gimmicky, and you know. And he kind of frowned on it. And you know that rebellious thing I said earlier, you know, that audacity thing was like f you. And I started writing more words, and you know, turning my paintbrush around and scratching words in there, and then you know, writing words on my arms. And I started to write. And suddenly, I thought to myself, Why am I wasting time with paints and palettes and and brushes and all this stuff? I just get a pen and pencil and write. I can just write what I think, and write what I want to say. You know, and that's that's how writing started to sort of evolve. You know, that's how I turned into that. Um, so the last thing I'm going to share, the last image here, um, I'm only going to talk for a little bit more. And then, uh, and then I'm hoping that some of you will ask some questions, OK? Um, this is my grandfather. This is um, Felix Hernandez, who was uh, born in Brownsville, Texas in like 1930. There he is uh, on his pickup truck with his uh, iconic hat and glasses. And oh, he's missing his iconic belt buckle. But uh, he has his iconic watch on. You just can't see it. Um, in 2006, he passed away. He gave me his watch. I still wear it to this day. And, you know, he mostly spoke Spanish, but he knew I was a pocho, and, you know, which is like you're saying, you know, you're like the brown dude who doesn't speak great Spanish, you know? <laughs> and, and in his hospital room, he goes, Mijo, take my watch. It's your time. And I thought, and I know he meant, or at least back then I thought, oh, he was trying to say it's your, it's your watch, or it's like, you know, this is your watch. And he was trying to convert, convert that into English, and he says, your time. And later on, I go, I think he knew what he was saying. <laughs> you know? uh, well, who am I to like, you know, try and correct the guy? You know? um, but one of the things um, that I wanted to share now, because this, is, um, this actually leads into a project that I've been writing and working on now for, gosh, five years, since 2010, a, a work of historical, um, so historical uh, you know, nonfiction uh, or historical fiction, even at times, novel. But it's basically a, of, a, of a historical incident. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I found myself in this, in this um, last five years interviewing people from um, on the, um, the Navajo Nation. I was up in the Navajo Nation interviewing um, folks there for this historical incident, some of them who had been a part, played a role in it. I was in Central California interviewing people, listening to their stories. And then I, got, and I went to Central Mexico and interviewed folks there. And, um, all of that kind of thing reminded me of, you know, how, do, how does one go about getting invested into something like this? And so I wrote, this is, I'm going to read to you the um, forward to the book that is, I just finished, and um, it's not published yet, but hopefully it will be soon. I'll get some good, good word on that, and I'll let you all know when I do. <clears throat> this is the forward to this book. It all began with a job he landed back in 2001. He was hired to travel into the rural parts of the San Joaquin Valley to meet with people and for the most part listen to their stories. As part of his job, the supervisor made him submit weekly write-ups. They were to be snapshots of people that he'd met or stories that he'd heard along the way. 
The problem was that the man was such a poor note taker, and by the end of each day, he had heard so many stories that he'd forgotten most of them. He needed a way to remember the details. And it was for this reason that he bought himself a handheld audio recorder, little tiny digital ones. Around that time, his grandfather, an aged farm worker, was admitted into the hospital. Fearing that the old man's time was up, the man went to visit him that day. When he arrived, he found his grandfather asleep in a dim, cold room alone. Believing that the old farm worker was near death, the man felt emboldened. He got physically close to his grandfather in a way that he never had before. He leaned in and observed his face, marveling at the toughness of his dark flesh, how his eyelids were sheets of leather draped above his high cheekbones, and how breath skidded in and out of his slightly parted lips. It was in that moment, while observing his grandfather closely, that a thought occurred to him. This old man, from whose seed he owed his whole existence to, was the last living grandparent he had. He was the single thread connecting this man to his own past. That sudden realization floored him. Beyond that, his grandfather was born in Brownsville, Texas, and had been a migrant farm worker since the age of 10, the man knew very little of his grandfather. The old campesino was surely more than just that stern-faced Tejano who used to hold jalapeno eating contests with his grandchildren to get a laugh. The old man was now living history. And the details of his life were suddenly a matter of great urgency. In that moment, alone with his grandfather, the man pulled out his recorder, and he decided that he would wait there until the old farm worker woke up. Almost 30 minutes passed before he began to stir. With both eyes shut, the old man reached for the IV, and he gave it a tug. He scratched at the stubble on his face, and then, as if sensing his grandson's present, the presence, the old man opened his eyes. He found his grandson sitting there at the edge of his bed. Mijo, he whispered to him. His voice was gravelly. The man handed his grandfather a cup of water. He took a drink. His hand trembled. What are you doing here? He was surprised to see his grandson. I want to hear about your life, Grandpa. The old man stared at his grandson with a blank expression, unsure if he was being serious. It was an unusual request, but then the old campesino responded almost too casually, as if he'd been waiting for such an opportunity. Okay, he said, placing his cup on the bedside table. He scratched his chin again. I have some things I want to tell you. What followed were not the details of his grandfather that any person would find in hospital files or the census or in any hall of records. No, these were the rememberings that, by the old campesino's understanding, made up the very core of who he was, his DNA in testimony. It was there in that quiet, dim hospital room, clutching his small recorder with that tiny red light flicking on and off, listening to his grandfather speak, that the man went from using that recorder for its practicality to transforming it into a tool for gathering stories, or rather as a way to ensure that certain stories were never lost. Thank you. <clears throat>